All right, uh, welcome back again, guys, for another episode of the Daily Show, where we talk about interesting facts and trivia's and other things uh, relating to history uh, for your daily knowledge, for everyone's daily knowledge. Um, happy, happy morning, happy noon time, or happy afternoon, or happy evening to uh, all of you guys. Whenever you guys are watching this um, episode, this show for today. Um, and speaking of which, today's episode is for September 23rd, and uh, we, or at least I, this is my first episode uh, of fall, um, if I'm not mistaken, Ian um, had the very first episode for fall, but, but however, I did have the last episode of summer, so there we go. Well, I mean, it's not really an achievement, but it's just fun to think about it. Anyways... Um, for today, we'll talk about uh, checkers. Um, there's also an observance called the uh, Remember Me Thursday. We'll talk about that too. Uh, we'll also talk about sign language. Um, one of our main sessions every Monday that we do, you know, sign language. Um, and then for our history, we'll talk about uh, Lewis and Clark returning to St. Louis and also the discovery of planet Neptune. Um, as far as the uh, planet of the week, it's Serbia this week, so we'll, di we'll also discuss an awesome national park located in Serbia. And as usual, stay tuned for our stuff of the day. Alright, so without further ado, uh, let's go ahead. Start with observance. So the first one I mentioned was checkers. But the thing is, it's not really about the uh, the game checkers. It's something else. As you can see, it's totally different from the picture. Uh, not the checkers, not the game checkers that, <laughs> that you know. Um, anyways, oddly enough, National Checkers Day doesn't have anything to do with po the popular board game. Rather, it commemorates the famous checkers speech by uh, Richard Nixon in 1952 after he received an adorable cocker uh, Spaniel as he sought election in 1952. Politicians are banned from uh, taking donations for their own use. So when he was accused of this by uh, his rivals, like many others seeking election, uh, Nixon faced allegations that he had misused donations for uh, election expenses and siphoned uh, these off for his personal use. Um, rather than shy away from these allegations, Nixon decided to address these head-on during a 30-minute TV debate. Uh, however, it was not his use of financial details that led to his speech becoming one of the most celebrated in history, or U.S. history at least. Uh, you guess it, it's about uh, the dog. <laughs> it's about the dog. Um, so again, the dog's breed is the uh, Cocker Spaniel. Um, to the public, when he was doing the speech, uh, he introduced checkers to the public, which he made it memorable. Uh, voters were won over when Nixon told them about his children's love for checkers. Uh, and because of checkers, another observance that became related to this day is uh, National Dogs and Politics Day, uh, which I will be mentioning in the other notable um, observance for later. But um yeah there you go i mean because of checkers there were like two two uh two holidays related to nixon or politics in general about dogs too so yeah but if you feel like playing checkers as you know like the the board game I'm, i don't see why not i mean you know it, if ever you're gonna be enjoying it anyways so i guess my question to you is not about checkers the dog but do you know how to play checkers? I know it, I know it hasn't have anything to do with our observances, but uh, we I mean a lot of people know the board game checkers too. So if you wanted to celebrate this observance, you, I guess you can play checkers. So if you know how to play checkers, if not, uh, maybe now's also the time to learn. So there you go. Another one that has something to do with pets. Second observance, Remember Me Thursday. So, pet lovers from around the world come together on Remember Me Thursday to shine a light on all the orphan pets that are in shelters and rescues while waiting for, you know, their, their hopefully forever home. 
um, the day unites pet lovers with pet adoption and animal welfare organizations for a common cause. Uh, by raising awareness and showing the importance of pet adoption, adoptions increase. And, uh, you know, the, the puppy meal, the puppy meals, <laughs> they're not food, puppy meals, there you go, puppy meals decrease. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there are still a lot of, um, of, of pet shelters that that are n not accommodating the uh, you know the animals enough and some worse you know they're having worse situations so remember me thursday is it's kind of uh celebrate well not celebrated but it's kind of uh there to remind people you know instead of um getting like some kind of fancy fancier animals and stuff maybe you can help by adopting some animals in um, animal shelter um, a large component of the day is lighting of candles uh, so this is another way to uh, do the observance but just be sure to be careful whenever you you would want uh, to celebrate this observance this way um, but of course the candle has a representation uh, real candles are lit at events often hosted by organizations and virtual candles are lit online by individuals with rescued pets so hey i mean that's a safer way to uh <laughs> lit some candles lit a virtual candle there you go um anyways who had a comp accompanying message about their pets and their candles uh, the, the idea behind this is that uh it is to light up the world for pet orphans in an effort to help others see the light about pet adoption so that orphans uh, orphan pets won't be ignored um, another integral part of the day is done in an effort to get the world talking about pet adoption now i really you know what personally i really wanted to have a pet i would adopt a pet if possible unfortunately where i'm living right now um, here in our apartment uh pets are not allowed so but I would love to. I mean, I remember if I'm if if I remember it uh, correctly, we used to have back in the Philippines when I was young. We used to have like five or six dogs. And that's a lot of pets, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I I think I told you guys that before, because uh, and and my 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 siblings, uh, they are very fond of pets too. Uh, we grew up taking care of um of dogs mainly but we uh in my experience growing up i also had uh, a pet hamster uh a pet chicken if if i haven't told you guys that but yes i used to have a pet chicken um but right now out of all our my siblings it's my sister and my brother who actually had a, a pet uh and then, oh, special my sister. My sister has like four big dogs. Oh man, one's grouchy. His name was uh, his name's a uh, uh, Duke D U K E, and he's I don't know. He's just always grouchy because maybe he thinks he's the Duke. I'm the Duke, you know. I'm 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 the one in charge. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyways, yeah. Uh, the Rescue Pet Hero Award was also given out each year, which recognizes a pet, a rescue pet that does something memorable. So, I mean, we gotta be nice to animals. It's nice to have um, organizations that actually saves animals. Uh, but we shouldn't stop there just because, you know, like, yeah, I guess they found shelter, uh, they find shelter, you know, from, from uh, being rescued here and there. But the thing though is a lot of these places that shelters animals still, um, you know, they're also having a hard time uh accommodating for all the pets they they you know they, they kind of like take take in so and again like in other countries some of these pets or some of these animals are living in worse conditions so it's it, i mean it's kind of sad but good thing we have this observance to um to promote to promote adoptions of pets that that needed a a better home there you go and uh, maybe something the third one maybe something you can teach your pet uh if i guess if we have a pet gorilla or any pets that have that's uh have similar um hands like us humans 
sign language right there. Oh, actually, there's a gorilla who knows how to do sign language and is able to communicate. Okay, so the reality is us humans are social creatures. We all know that. Um, we even have a saying, uh, no man is an island, right? Uh, at some point in time, we are going to need to have someone to talk to, to interact with, to, uh, to socialize with. So, yeah. And of course, since we are social creatures in our society, communication is very important. It's very important for us to express ourselves, to be understood. Um, so, uh, the thing is, imagine a world where no one can understand you or care to understand you. Don't even put effort to understand you. So, the thing is, wouldn't that be so frustrating? I mean, just imagining about that, or just imagining me in that world is, is yeah, I'm, I'm already feeling frustrated, you know? So, the thing is that that would be what other people feel in their everyday life if they are not able to express themselves uh, in a um, normal way circumstances uh, under the societal standards you know um, especially if they don't have the ability to communicate verbally using their own voices um, the good news however is that there's another way for them to communicate and that is the sign language um, additionally today is a day to celebrate sign language too um, if all right here's the thing sign language is still very useful because the, the technology, even though we have these awesome technology now, like the one that Stephen Hawking, for example, is using, um, he could talk through the computer. It's The thing is, it's not accessible to everyone yet. It's not as common. Um, I know we got one of our students who had the similar, uh, well, I mean, similar concept. Um, and then there are also apps in smartphones and tablets now where you can, uh, you know, uh, how do you say it? customize it to your preference you can actually um, like let's say it's all about food like this app for communication can actually um, be customized to so just have one page of all kinds of foods that you could um, communicate with and then um, different category and so on so, so forth so yes we do have some some of those awesome technology now but still like i said it's not as accessible as a sign language plus sign language learning sign language is it's like learning a new language a different language you know so back to the observance uh this observance is celebrated annually across the world along with international week of the deaf uh the choice of 23 or the 23rd of september is the same date as the uh, world federation of the deaf uh, was established in 1951 so that's the reason behind why this observance uh, fell on um, September 23rd today uh, did you know that there are roughly 72 million deaf people around the world this is a statistic from the uh, World Federation of the Deaf collectively these people use over 300 different sign language uh, while they may be different structurally and spoke to the spoken language they should be given just as much credit and importance. There is also an international sign language. Uh, this type, oh, because by the way, there are different kinds of sign language. There's English sign language, uh, primarily in the UK region. We have the ASL here in the US, American sign language. Um, and then there's also the international sign language, which from what it sounds like, I, I'm not very fluent in sign language. I know um, American sign language in general, um, but from what it's, you know, from, from the sound of its name, it seems to be a type of sign language that will be used, I mean, internationally. It's already part of the name, right? Um, so, a very convenient way to learn that, especially if you've been. Um, I guess traveling, traveling from different places, different countries also. Um, it is not clear how many of these languages exist around the world. Um, generally, each country has its own native sign language. In fact, some countries have more than one. You may be interested to learn a bit more about the history of sign language too. Um, these languages have been used throughout history by groups of deaf people. 
In fact, one of the earliest written records of a sign language was in Plato's Cratylus um, from the 15th century BC. That's how far, that's how uh, old the concept of sign language is. Pretty awesome. First School of Deaf Children was founded in Paris in 1755. Uh, the most famous graduate from there is arguably Laurent Clark. Uh, he went to the U.S. and set up the American School for the Deaf in 1817 with Thomas, Hop Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. There you go. I, I kind of have to repeat it because you know, I try my best not to mispronounce names, but a lot of these names, if they're not American names or English names, they're kind of hard to pronounce. <laughs> Um, the school can be found in West Hartford, Connecticut, and is actually the oldest permanent school for the deaf in the uh, U.S. here, um, with around 174 students attending today. But, see, the thing is, it's only 174 students. That's not really a lot of, um, of students. On the other hand, um, learning sign language is more accessible than ever because thanks to our technology, again, smartphones um uh computers internet you know and that's that's also how we're uh, we're learning some sign language in our zoom class there's this website it's called handspeak.com if you guys are interested in learning it's not necessarily ne necessarily going to teach you how to uh construct a sentence in sign language but you'll be able to sign different words a lot of words actually where we're um, that's how I'm trying to learn. I'm also trying to learn how to construct a sentence uh, through ASL but uh, right now or as a, as a starter if you are totally um, Not familiar if you're totally not familiar with sign language. I would recommend learning words first You know what I do is I, I think of a theme like uh, like for example today what kind of theme or topic would I want to learn when it comes to sign language you could start with uh, your your smaller circle your family family members mom dad uh, aunt uncle you know and then you can expand it with let's say jobs or professions around the uh, or within the society you know like doctors mailmen uh, uh, <laughs> architect <clears throat> uh, oh man <laughs> My, my throat's getting uh, <clears throat> itchy. Um, what else? I mean, there's a lot, right? There's a lot, definitely. Oh, drivers, you know, pilots. So, engineers. So, yeah, something like that. Um, and then when you're kind of getting more familiar, now that's that will be the uh, a good time to learn um, how to construct sentences. In sign language, of course. Yeah. All right, so um, again, those are three major observances that will that we have for today. We also have other notable observances right there. We got four additional for today. Let's start with the first one. It says energize day, not energize, inner, the opposite of outer. Energize day. Now, what, what does this mean? Well, energize day is to uh, be the time of rest and relaxation which yeah, another observance is for relaxation if I'm not mistaken um, on the 21st of September which is still my episode I did mention an observance about relaxation too but I guess there's another day if uh, or there's another observance if you miss that if you miss celebrating that observance for that day <laughs> you you know you got it covered cool <laughs> anyways um, this is an observance about promoting time of rest and relaxation so that the body can be rejuvenated. Um, whatever you do today should take your mind off whatever grinding work you've been doing. So for today, energize, energize, not energize, inner, energize. Kind of like you energize your inner self <laughs> by relaxing, by relaxing right there. Um, and also, you know, you relax today, you get ready for whatever tasks you'll face tomorrow or the next day. So, um, okay, I, I like that. I like that. Maybe after this show, I'll be energizing myself <laughs> by watching some of my uh, uh, favorite TV shows I'm looking forward to, you know, like 
uh, Marvel's What If, have some uh, Disney TV shows that I'll be watching. I don't know, just saying. Alright, the next one, we have Restless Legs Awareness Day. Now, you might think it's kind of like the total opposite of the uh, last observance, right? Uh, technically, it is, you know, uh, it's kind of like the opposite, but uh, pay attention to the word awareness. So, again, it's an awareness day, then it's a day to promote awareness of something. And a lot of times, awareness day is about, you know, some kind of uh, disorder or disease or, or uh, uh, what do you call this? Or something basically not so good, right? Um, so, for today... Uh, restless legs awareness day is to rest is to raise awareness about the restless leg syndrome there you go um, restless leg syndrome or RLS um, also known as Willis Ekbaum disease is characterized by uncontrollable uncontrollable urges to move the leg Wow that's interesting there is a syndrome where your your, your body or your legs you know you kind of feel like you you wanted to keep your legs moving hmm. you know what this is cool because i wasn't um aware there you go that's i guess this is a uh, the, the perfect day to learn about this syndrome because i personally am not aware about this kind of syndrome um just imagine having having this syndrome like you have to you know you you feel the urge to keep your legs moving that's, uh, that could be tiring, definitely. Um, the condition affects approximately 7% of the population. And it might sound like a small number, rem but remember, <laughs> we are about eight, more than 8 billion um, people here in, uh, on Earth. So 7% of 8 billion is a lot, a lot of people. So um, again, I gotta be honest, I have no idea that this thing is a thing until today uh, very interesting you know and that's I guess that's one good thing about a lot of awareness um, for the observance is if you haven't heard about about this then now you do now you do now you have an idea that some people are suffering from this kind of syndrome this disease so yeah all right well back to uh, something good national snack stick day so uh, if you have a snack you can put it on a stick. There you go. That's how you celebrate it. Pretty plain, pretty uh, straightforward. And then another one is another good food. National Great American Pop Pie Day. Wow. I mean, I <laughs> this is this observance. This observance just had the word great in it. National. It's not. It's not just American pot pie, but it's the Great American Pot Pie. Now, what could be greater than American pot pie? You know. Um, it did sound like Popeye when I said pot pie. <laughs> Not the Popeye's chicken, alright? I'm talking about the pot pie. There you go. So, those are all our observances. Um, we got four additional. If you choose to not celebrate the first three or if you wanted to celebrate more. Alright, today in history. In 1806, we got Lewis and Clark returning to St. Louis. Um, amid much public excitement, American explorers Meriwether Lewis and William Clark returned to St. Louis, Missouri from the first recorded overland journey um, from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Coast and back. The Lewis and Clark expedition had set off more than two years before to explore or before to explore the territory of the Louisiana Purchase. There you go. Um, even before the U.S. government concluded purchase negotiations with France, President Thomas Jefferson commissioned his private secretary, uh, Lewis and Clark, <clears throat> an army captain, to lead an expedition into what is now the U.S. Northwest. And then on May 14, the Corps of Discovery, uh, featuring some two dozen men, left St. Louis for the American interior. There you go. Now, you might be asking me, are, are those the actual look of Lewis and Clark? I can, I would tell you right now, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But this is more of a painting, not a photo, obviously. It's in 1806. 
um, the invention of cameras are not uh, or cameras in general were not invented yet so it's more of a just painting and when it comes to painting um, it's there's there's a um, there's a style I forgot uh, Joe's always um, showcasing that style of painting where it's you know it's an inanimated object it's not moving so you can actually copy it because this is not moving but I doubt that's the same style that they use for Lewis and Clark in this painting right here because I mean come on as us humans it's impossible for us to stay put just saying you know <laughs> plus it's gonna take about hours I don't think they'll be standing there for hours just to be painted but then again there are some uh, royalty uh, portrait back in the day you know they, they they get painted so they won't be moving for hours long so it could be <laughs> it could be that but then again I'm not sure so I just want to disclose that however what I'm sure at is this picture right here this is a definite picture of Neptune right there and in 1846 this planet blue giant planet um, was discovered there you go. Uh, German astronomer Johann or Johann Gottfried Gall uh, discovered the planet Neptune at the Berlin Observatory. So Neptune, generally the eighth planet from the Sun, was postulated by the French astronomer Urbain Jean Joseph Le Verrier or Le Verrier. There you go. A lot of French names. I'm not good with that. I I, I would have uh, asked for Ian's help, but he's not here right now. Anyways, um, this astronomer, this French astronomer, calculated uh, the approximate locations of the planet by studying gravity-induced disturbances in the motions of Uranus. Um, on September 23rd, or today in 1846, Le Verrier inform informed Gall of his findings, and the uh, same night. Gall and his assistants um, identified Neptune at their observatory in Berlin. Noting this movement relative um, to background stars over 24 hours confirmed that it was a planet. See, these uh, parts of history are awesome because again, 1846, you don't have any strong computer that time. Uh, calculations are all manual. And because of them, because of these um, astronomers, these scientists, uh, philosophers back in the day, it's all thanks to them that we got better understanding of how our world works, how the society works. And, and uh, you know, well, we're, we're still learning is consistent. So we're, we as humans keep on studying, even though we already learned here. Yeah, Neptune is a planet, for example. Well, I mean. Not for example, it is for real, but I mean the scenario I was talking about, for example. Uh, Alright, we learned Neptune as a planet, now are we gonna stop there? Well, no, I mean, there's a lot of things to learn and the the, uh, the knowledge we can get from, from learning and researching is just awesome, you know? Um, just make sure, or just a friendly reminder, that all the knowledge we accumulate um, so far it's always best to use it for good, for the betterment of everyone. I thank you. <laughs> Alright, so the blues ga uh, the blues <laughs> the blue gas giant, which has a diameter uh, four times of the earth, was named after the Roman god of the sea. Yes. Uh, it has eight known moons, of which Triton is the largest, and a ring system containing three bright and two dim rings. It completes an orbit of the sun once in every 165 years. Very awesome. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the name of the moon that I just mentioned. Again, the most or the largest one, li largest moon um, orbiting Neptune is Triton. Triton, where they're T R I T O N. Um, if ever Joe has uh, taught you guys about this, so. Let me know in the comment section below if uh, that sounded familiar to you guys. Uh, and then in 1989, the uh, US planetary spacecraft Voyager 2 was the first human spacecraft to visit Neptune. Wait, what? First human spacecraft? No, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of that. <laughs> Wait. 
All right, moving on to notable figure born today. The first one on the list is Victoria Woodhull, 1838. Um, she's the first woman to run for the presidency of the United States in 1872 as part of the Equal Opportunities Party. Woodhull was an important activist for women, women's rights, labor reforms, and the freedom to marry, divorce, and bear children without government interference. And then, next up, we have 1930, Ray Charles. Uh, he was known professionally as Ray Charles. Uh, that's, that means that's not his real name. Um, he helped pioneer soul music with hits such as Hit the Road, Jack, uh, Georgia on My Mind, and I Can't Stop Loving You. Ray started to lose his sight at the age of 4 or 5 and was completely blind by the age of 7, apparently resulting from glaucoma. Um, among friends and fellow musicians, he preferred being called Brother Ray, but was often referred to as the genius. There you go. Um, a question for you guys about Ray Charles. What is your favorite song? There you go. What's your favorite song from uh, Ray Charles? Leave it in the comment section below, as usual. Another musician. We got Bruce Springsteen, 1949. Nicknamed The Boss, Springsteen is an iconic fixture of American music. His style concentrates on his distinctive voice and lyrics, often concerning working-class Americans. Um, his tours, often with the uh, E Street Band, are noted for their energetic performances and often long length. His commercial sales with famous albums such as Born to Run and Born in the USA, the both songs with the word Born in it, <laughs> have reached over 120 million sold. Pretty awesome. So. If ever you guys are more familiar with Bruce Springsteen, now for Bruce Springsteen, I want you guys to leave two or let me know, uh, tell me two of your favorite songs by Bruce Springsteen. Alright, uh, plays of the week, we're going to Serbia and now, oh, it didn't show the picture, I guess I have to click more, <laughs> here we go. Tara National Park. So an awesome looking park right there. You know, usually when you say park, it's like, uh, I, I guess woodlands and stuff like that. But hey, I mean, this one's pretty awesome. That's a big body of water right there. Uh, located in the uh, Dinaric, is that how you pronounce it? Dinaric? No. Located in the Dinaric Alps. I would just go with that. Tara National Park includes the Adrena River Canyon, which is one of the largest in the world. Again, it's not the largest, it's one of the largest. Um, if you love adventure and getting out of the water, you'll want to visit one of the park's two lakes, um, which are famous for the conditions they offer to would-be kayakers and those going out in canoes. The park also offers uh, tons of great options for those looking to go hiking um, chase waterfalls or even stay a few days in the cabin in the woods so this is a very good vacation spot of course it's a definitely a plus a plus plus if you're a nature lover because just look at that just look at this amazing looking national park right there you know, all green you get the, you see the water and pretty awesome it's pretty awesome okay stuff of the day time for our stuff of the day guys uh, f another um, character from Winnie the Pooh, if we talked about Piglet last time, we're going to be talking Eeyore. Um, so Eeyore is a bit uh, pessimistic and gloomy. I mean, you know, like every time we see Eeyore in episodes of Winnie the Pooh, he's always sad. Um, he's a sad donkey, and but at least he's still a friend of Christopher Robin. Um, and I just mentioned he was based from an animal. Donkey. Donkey. I was gonna put Donkey from Shrek, but Shrek is not really Disney. Uh, they're DreamWorks, so... But, I mean, same animal... Uh, <clears throat> what do you call this? Uh, basis. Right there. There you go. Basis. So, as, a pic as the picture of the real donkey, we got that. There you go. So, an av average donkey uh, stands about 40 inches at the uh, shoulder. But different breeds vary greatly in shape and size. Donkeys range from white to gray to black in color, and they usually have a dark stripe from the mane 
uh, to the tail and a crosswise stripe on the shoulders. The mane is short and upright and the tail has long hair only at the end. The ears are very long and are dark at the base and tip. So anyways, uh, you, everyone should know by now that donkeys are generally smaller than uh, regular horses and they're slower too. Um, but although that's the case, donkeys are sure-footed and carry heavy loads over rough terrains. Um, the mule is a hybrid of a donkey and horse. Um, <clears throat> in some parts of the world where horses cannot easily survive or weather extreme poverty prevents locals from owning horses, donkeys, um, they are there to save the day. You know, they are the main beasts of burdens and a source of transportation. Moving on to our plan of the day, and if you guys notice, we're done with summer. We're going fall now. Here you go. So you're going to see, I guess, a lot of uh, yellows and oranges for fall. Um, for our first plan of the day for fall, uh, we got marigold. Oh, I mean, at least for this theme, I was going to say, I guess this is not the first plan because Ian's doing the, you know, the first episode of fall. But then again, he has a different uh, theme for his episode. So, yeah. Um, anyways, marigolds or marigolds are best grown in full sun and are great fall plants for your garden. Uh, they are native to Mexico and Central America, but have become popular with home gardeners across North America uh, due to their brilliant colors and easy to grow nature. Try mixing them uh, with chrysanthemums. So, you know, for color combination, very good looking um, collection of flowers, definitely. Together, they produce vibrant colors that will last well into fall. So if you are a flower person or if you have a garden, um, chrysanthemums and marigold, very good combination. All right, um, we are still in September, so we're going to be still talking about Backstreet Boys and another song from them, All I Have to Give, 1998. Uh, this song charted in the top 10 in several countries, including a debut at number 2 on the UK singles chart, number 3 in Canada, 4 in Australia, and number 8 in Germany during 1998. It also reached number 1 in Spain and on the UK indie chart. Right there. There you go. They do have a lot of... I mean, they, they're not famous for no reason. A lot of their songs are always being played in the radio up until now especially you know like the upbeat ones so there you go that's just one of their um, awesome songs all right moving on word of the day we got hypoxemia it's a noun let me uh, spell it for you guys for now um h y p o x e m i a and i think i just noticed that the my lightings went dark because my natural light, which is the sun, uh, kind of sad. Hold on one second. Let me, let me, uh, what do you call this? Turn the uh, blinds around or open the blinds. All right, I'm back. So there you go. Much better. <laughs> it's more lit. Um, anyway, so what is hypoxemia? Well, it's a medical term, first and foremost. Um, it's a noun, generally. Uh, it means an abnormally low concentration of oxygen in the blood. Now, this is not a good thing. Definitely not a good thing. Uh, when the tissues in your body don't get enough oxygen, they will start performing poorly. And the most important thing is there's one tissue that is going to be heavily at risk in this, and that's your brain. Yes, your brain definitely needs oxygen to function. So hypoxemia is not a good thing because the uh, concentration of your oxygen in your blood is low. Therefore, it's going to affect not just your uh, tissues. Uh, well, your tissues mainly, but especially your brain. So there you go. Now, last part of the um, daily show today. Tech trivia. Did you guys know? This is interesting. In 1936, Russia built a computer that ran on water. How come this didn't become a thing? This is pretty awesome. You you got like you got like water instead of electricity. Well, uh, let's read on it. Actually, 
So before the miniatur miniaturization of transistors, like making them small, uh, computers had a much more visible um, system of counting. Um, if you guys remember, like the storage of 5 MB storage in one of my tech trivias is about the size of a room where you can store the data. Uh, yeah, like that. So imagine transistors. Um, that's why they're, look at the picture right there. That's the one, that's the computer that ran in water, 1936. They're all like, all bulky. Again, it covers the whole room, right? So yeah, uh, things like gears, pivots, beads, and levers were often used and they needed some sort of power source to function. Um, Vladimir Luk Lukyanov, Vlad Vladimir Lukyanov um, built something like this in the 1936, but instead he used water to create a computer that solved partial differential equations. And in, in the images of the uh, Lukyanov computer, you'll see a complex system of interconnected tubes filled with water. Adjusting taps and plugs altered the flow of water and changed variables. Uh, that was my Alexa. <laughs> the level of the water certain tubes. Um, it was also called a water integrator and was originally designed to solve the problem of cracking in concrete. It is now found in Mo Moscow's Polytechnic Museum. Wow. So that's pretty awesome. They actually preserved it, you know. But if you're asking me as to why they didn't pursue any, um, what it calls, water powered computer, well, first, this is not really the high end computer that we have now that is powered with electricity, where you could see displays as awesome as this. Well, I, we can do, um, uh, I was gonna say Zoom. No, we can do, I, I can do OBS recording like this where you can see me in one part and then the background in a different one, you know? So, I don't think that's something possible in a computer powered by water. No. Uh, maybe it could be if somebody per, uh, pursued it, but I don't, I don't see how it's gonna happen anytime soon. With that said though, it's pretty amazing to see uh, something um, like this. There's a similar tech that I remember it's a uh, it's a vehicle that is water powered instead of gas um but it i guess just like any other uh not not any other inventions but any any other uh, unique inventions in a way um it didn't it didn't you know it didn't become that well known well granted all inventions are unique in general you know that's why you're inventing something when you invent something it means that you're making something new, right? Now, when you say innovation, that means you are making whatever existing tech or invention uh, at that time has, uh, you're making it better. So, yeah, you're innovating. So, um, But, yeah, there you go, guys. Uh, that's our episode for today. I'm trying to still test my audio. So... I guess the way I'm talking right now is more like a little bit subtle. I'm not sure if uh, it's making a difference, but uh, yeah, I'm adjusting my audio. So I'm trying to see if this is better. And if ever I'm going to be talking like this, um, starting from now on, because sometimes I'll be like laughing hard or, or unconsciously increasing my, uh, my voice, the volume of my voice. So now it's just mellow right there. But anyways, um, thank you for sticking with me until the end of the episode. Hope you like it. Hope you learned something new. Uh, as always, do not forget to uh, leave your thoughts about the topics we discussed in the comment section below. And as always, uh, I'll be seeing you uh, next time, next episode of The Daily Show. So bye for now.